so George is the immediate past president of Oakmont Sunday Symposium. He was a member of Symposium's board of directors for five years, the first two as vice president, the last three as our president. And he steered Symposium through the difficult pandemic and subsequent shutdown of OVA facilities by shifting Symposium talks to Zoom only, and later to a hybrid model of Zoom plus in-person symposium presentations. But George's contributions to Oakmont extend well beyond Sunday Symposium. And it's no wonder he was the recipient of Oakmont's Volunteer of the Year Award in 2019. For many years, he has taken an active role in Oakmont's long range planning committees and he founded both the Oakmont Genealogy Club and the Oakmont Future Club. The Futures Club has led to spin-offs, including the Solar Committee and the Electric Vehicles Club. George is a very active member of Oakmont's Emergency Preparedness Committee and has his ham radio operator license. He runs the Map Your Neighborhood MYN Emergency Preparedness Group in his neighborhood and is active in wildfire safety and neighborhood watch. George is a strong advocate for aging in place. He is a proponent of using Zoom, closed captioning, and other accommodations so Oakmont residents with disabilities can participate in the various Oakmont clubs and activities. Of all the many activities that George is involved in, perhaps the one that is most fun is Oakmont's Grandparents Club. He and his wonderful wife, Marie, would you stand, Marie? He, he and Marie founded Oakmont's Grandparents Club. And I'm quite sure there are many other contributions that George has made during his 20 years that he and Marie have lived in Oakmont, but I'll stop here. So George, the Oakmont Symposium Board gratefully gives you, commemorates your years of service with this lifetime pass. And we also have a gift certificate for dinner or a meal at River's End. And with that, I'll turn it over to George for his remarks. Without holding everybody, let me say that uh... The last two and a half years have kind of been interesting for Oakmont, if not for the symposium. But I am so thankful to have had a staff with this whole board of directors that was really able to move quickly and keep us as a part of the world while COVID was shutting down these facilities. And uh, we jumped onto Zoom, we made it work. And I want to thank the audience, the faithful audience, that put up with all of the little glitches that occurred as we learned to go on to Zoom and to participate in these activities. Finally, I would like to say that uh, Virginia Katz has taken on the symposium as the president, and I wish her the best in bringing the symposium back to where we were four years ago. And now, Sue Dibble is going to introduce Serena. Sue was formerly on the board of directors for Symposium and was, the, uh, was able to get Serena to talk to us. Good morning. Um, I'm very fortunate to actually have Serena come and talk to us. She's very knowledgeable. She has a bachelor's in kinesiology therapeutic exercise and rehab with a minor in psychology which of course you need that for us um, she completed her master master's of physical therapy and then she got her doctorate um, so she is uh has also lots of training in strain counter strain technique and she does orthotics for your foot and she has a special interest in geriatrics. Good thing. 
Um, prior to being a physical therapist, Serena was a competitive gymnast for Sacramento State during her un undergrad years. And she volunteers her time for the young gymnasts today to try to make sure that they stay healthy. Um, 11 months ago, she bought from her boss, OSBT. So she owns orthopedic and sports therapy here and in Farmer's Lane. So the buck stops with her, <laughs> but she's, she's an awesome speaker. So I, you're very lucky today. I take, there it goes. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out in the rain. I'm going to try and get this to screen share again because we had to switch that and it should go. Yay. Okay. So if you didn't know what we're talking about today, it's osteoporosis. So I see a lot of familiar faces, some people I recognize from here up and some people I just recognize your whole face, which is great. So nice to see you all again. Um, I did work out at this clinic um, right over here for the first six years at OSBT. The last two years I've been over at the Farmer's Lane site and I come over every once in a while. So Sue already introduced me. Um, oh, let me see, there it goes. But that's basically what she just introduced in a little nutshell. Um, so we can move right on into what we're gonna do today. So today we're gonna talk about osteoporosis and osteopenia. Um, they're both very close to each other. One actually leads into the other. We're gonna talk about the risk factors of the osteoporosis and penia, um, some prevention in exercises for also the osteopenia and porosis. So at the end, I'll show you guys all a bunch of exercises. In the beginning, we're going to go through a lot of just the, the nuts and bolts of osteoporosis. Um, and then it, if needed, um, I have a PDF document um, that we can share with you all. If you guys wanted to see the exercises or take that print at home, or I can email it to you. So we can do all that afterwards as well, just in case. So what is osteoporosis and osteopenia? In case you didn't know, hopefully you guys kind of have a little idea of it, but it's basically when that bone condition, uh, it's a condition of the bones when the, it's losing that mineral density. So it's not establishing enough or it's starting to lose too much. Bones are living tissue, so they do change over time. When we're kids, we're building our bones. And when we're adults, we're just trying to maintain our bones. Um, normal bone should look nice and thick and, and, and dense like this top picture um, with that really nice density. The bottom picture is that osteoporosis and it kind of looks more like a pumice stone. There's bigger gaps, there's bigger holes and it's just more brittle. Um, and so that's that cross section. So the outside of the bone is still gonna kind of look like this but when you were to cut it in half, it would look a lot more open on the inside. And that just takes away some of the scaffolding and so things are more brittle and easier to break. Um, pumice stone is a great example of, of what you can think about. You can kind of hold it, but if you were to stick your nail in it, you could kind of actually dent it into there. Um, so how do they detect it? Some people go around not knowing they have osteopenia or porosis until they actually have a fall. So sometimes it's detected on that first x-ray. Um, quite often that's the worst Thing that a person gets to hear is that, oh, and by the way, you have weak bones, so now we get to worry about this. Um, because falls become a huge issue going forward once you have osteoporosis. You don't really want to fall because your bones are just so fragile that you might break and they're harder to recover because those bones have to heal. Um, so fracture is sometimes the first detection. Otherwise, people are taking their DEXA scans because the doctors are looking at preventative measures, which is great. So that DEXA scan is scanning to see how dense your bone is. They can scan it in a few different areas. Sometimes they do a full body DEXA scan, which is nice because you get to see the back, the arm, and the hip. Those are the most common areas that we look at. 
Um, and basically it kind of gives us an idea of like how dense your bone is compared to the general population for your age. And we'll get into that in the next slide. Um, also x-rays are a great tool. Sometimes just a general x-ray is how they'll detect it too. If you go in for um, a, a wrist sprain, they do a preventative x-ray and they notice, wow, your bones aren't really white. They're kind of showing up gray on the screen. Um, maybe we should look further into this, even without a fracture. They just don't look as dense as they should be because that's what the x-ray can pick up as well. So those are kind of the ways that we're gonna see in testing there's not a blood test. It's pretty much just imaging um, for that osteoporosis. So one of the things they're starting to realize, which I kind of noticed a few years back, was that height loss is another thing. Now it's just an indicator. It's not meaning that if you've lost more than two or three inches that you absolutely have osteoporosis as we get older. But they are noticing correlation that people that have lost three, four inches of height, they used to be five feet tall and now they're in the fours again. That's also indicative that you might have some osteoporosis because your spine is actually kind of crushing in on itself, um, which is not fun. Um, scary for somebody like me who's only 5'1", because I would be really short then. Um, but so you might've seen some of your friends who are osteoporotic that they have lost some height, a little bit more than the average bear, and that usually is due to compression fractures that are happening that they may not know about. They've always had that chronic back pain, but never really, it was bad enough to go to the doctor. They just kind of muddled through it because we've all had back pain at some point in time. Um, but so be aware that if you've lost a lot of height, you have had chronic back pain, it might not be bad to check in with your physician and see, do I have osteoporosis or penia? Um, I've lost like three or four inches from when I last really remembered my tallest moment in my height, um, just because it's one of the ways they can also detect it. Otherwise, you won't know if you have it. Um, so the difference, this is where that T-score I mentioned before on the DEXA scan um, basically comes in handy. So your T-score is what the DEXA scan is going to show you. And that is basically comparing you to a person your age for average bone density. So if anything from a, a, above a negative one and above is good, kind of like a spectrum. Anything from a negative one to a negative 2.5 means that you're in the osteopenia range. And so they're gonna look usually, hopefully, at a few places. I mentioned earlier, they look at the spine usually, They'll look at the arm or they'll look at the femur because those are the vulnerable spots. So if your test comes back and it says you're a 1.6, you're technically in that osteopenia area. Now, if you take a test a few years later, you decided I don't want to do anything about it right now, it's not that bad, and you all of a sudden are now a 2.6 negative 2.6 it is, that means that you now have crossed over that threshold and you're into osteoporosis. So the bones have gotten even more brittle. So that's how we read those DEXA scans. And so they usually do comparisons over years. Some doctors do it every year. Some doctors do it every two years. It kind of depends on where you are and how stable you are or what medicine you're on or what exercise regimen you're on. So each person's different, um, but they'll compare that and they'll see so are we still in the twos or have we gotten better and gotten back up into the ones or have we gotten into the positive sides? So um, I've had my own DEXA done. It's kind of cool. You just kind of lay really still. I had the whole body one. Um, I'm like a 1.5. So I was like, yes, I got lots to lose. Um, I'm only 41. So I have many more years to keep my bones healthy. <laughs> um, but so that's, if you ever wondered how they're reading those scans, it's kind of a spectrum. It's like a line graph. You're going to go back and forth. We're hoping to get you back to the negative one side and above because that means that you're closer to normal for your age range. Um, and that means that your bones are a little bit more dense. It's also why if you've gone on the pharmacolog pharmacological route where you're taking like Boniva or any of those, why they do a DEXA scan later to see if it did anything. Did it help? Did it not? Um, okay. I get lots of questions about that one. So causes and risk factors. So about half of our bone density is related to our genetics. So you can thank your parents or you can not thank them. Um, but unfortunately, half of it's just the way you're put together from what you get from mom and dad. 
then the other half about is due to the environmental and nutritional factors. So they're both important. It's not just exercise, it's also eating well. Um, so there's a lot of factors and we're gonna go over those um, factors in just a little bit. So this is the, the biggest factors that they've looked at in meta exams. So low body weight, overweightness, poor calcium intake, high sodium intake, too much caffeine, too much cola, too much smoking, too much alcohol, not getting enough sun, and poor physical activity. So all of those contribute. It's not just one. You also have to think my genetics and my setup for this as well. So all of that plays into could I possibly ever be at risk for osteopenia or osteoporosis? We're going to go into each one of those individually. So low body weight and overweight. So low body weight isn't good because it's usually linked with malnourishment. So you're not getting in enough nutrients. And if you don't have enough fuel in the tank, you're not gonna build the bones, which isn't good. So that's not good. Also excess body weight, they think it's because it's poor choices of food. So you're not getting all the nutrients, you're eating the sugars and the fats that aren't really helpful and not the minerals and the vitamin Ds and stuff. Um, so the other thing is that if you are overweight, just losing overweight, losing that excess weight doesn't improve your bone density if that's what you were hoping. Um, it really has to do more with your actual diet in general as if it's a healthy, well-rounded diet to keep your bones healthy, okay? Um, low calcium intake. So I think you guys are all of the got drink milk generation for strong bones. Um, milk isn't always your first choice. I have a list at the end of what is good. Um, vegetables, there's tons of vegetables that are great for us and tofus and beans and stuff like that. But the current literature is basically saying that in our youth, 20% of our bone density is based basically on what we're eating. So hopefully you guys, when you were younger, listened to your parents, had nice well-rounded meals, dark leafy greens, had some milk, um, because that's kind of that setting the stage. So I'm hoping in this generation of kids, parents are getting to, to again, back to these better meals, less TV dinners, less salt, less stuff like that. Um, and hopefully they're learning this in their health classes too, that it's good to have nice strong bones with good food. So roughly as we're an adult, and I think we're all adults in here, I don't have any, I don't see any pediatrics. We need about a thousand to 1,200 milligrams of, of uh, calcium a day. And you can get that in various ways, um, but that's what they're showing to still be the amount that you need. Um, now they do change guidelines every once in a while. It usually happens really slow, but you, if you ever are curious, you can always look at um, the USDA, the, um, the dietary guidelines and they'll help you out um, or ask your, your primary care. They should know too, if they ever change it. It hasn't been changed for a long time though. So we're gonna talk a little bit about sodium intake. So taking, eating a lot of sodium. So like kind of the canned food, the TV dinner rounds, um, adding a lot of salt to your food does actually kind of increase that calcium excretion in your urine. So it kind of leaches it a little bit and you don't absorb as much. So think about that. Um, if you are a person that likes really salty stuff, that it is also possibly a risk factor. Doesn't mean you have to go off of salt completely because you do need some salt in your diet. Your, your, all of your um, cells actually work on, with, with sodium. So you do need some, um, but you might want to look and see on the back of some of prepackaged food, which is convenient, but usually it's a huge preservative. If you're eating two or three things that are prepackaged foods that have a 30 or a 40% of your daily allowance in each serving, that might be too much for the day. So you want to think about that. Um, they're great convenience wise, but they, they can sneak in a lot of salt and you just don't realize it um, if you're eating more of the prepackaged stuff. Okay. The good news is though, if you like to take those little viactive chews or you wanna take some calcium with it, some healthy healthy foods that have calcium, you can kind of interact, um, uh, kind of sideline it a little bit, counteract that loss. So if you are a person that really likes those convenient foods and you wanna work around, you may look into something along the lines of viactive. Those are those little tiny calcium chews 
or your um, over-the-counter calcium supplements, um, or just leave, follow it up with some, some kale or something healthy. So there is a little work around if you're a high salt lover. I like salt, sorry. Um, caffeine for all you coffee drinkers, if you didn't know that like four cups and we're talking like actual cups, like eight ounce cups, not, not the Starbucks cups. Um, they do have a decent amount of caffeine in them and that actually can lower your bone density. Um, so if you have been an avid coffee drinker, just know that that is a risk factor um, and it may be something worth cutting back on. It's kind of hard if you really like it though. Um, so again, this is another one where they did find some studies um, basically show that if you do a calcium supplement, it can counteract that a little bit, which is kind of nice because coffee's great. It's really good. So, um, and it's not a huge amount that you need to actually uh, counteract it, which is kind of nice. Um, cola consumption, that's kind of a big thing for um, people. Um, it's the phosphoric acid in the cola that actually can be pretty risky. So it may be something that if you like to drink a lot of the carbonated fizzy stuff to think, hmm, maybe I could cut back on this and just drink water um, just because it's a little bit better for you. Also, it's just, it, they're completely the void of all nutrition. So unfortunately, I mean, they taste good, but you could be replacing it with something that might actually be healthy for you. Um, so that's one of the aspects of, of cola that's not really, really good either. Not only does it leach, but it's just, it doesn't give you anything back. It doesn't even really hydrate you, unfortunately, due to the os osmolarity of it. Excessive alcohol intake is another issue. Um, so it's interfering possibly with the metabolism of the cells for the bone density. So um, not so much of the leaching aspect, but um, deficiencies that elsewhere um, also play into this. Um, and also it's another one of those things where it's just kind of like soda. There's really no nutritional benefit. So you're drinking something, you feel full or satiated, but you're not actually getting a benefit out of it. So your bones aren't going to benefit from this as well. In addition to the possibility of it interfering with that healthy bone, living tissue, bone metabolism. Um, I know a lot of people don't realize that bones are a living thing and that's, that's very important. Uh, that's why we can make these little changes with our food, diet, and exercise that can help. Smoking is another one. Um, it's mostly the early adulthood when you're laying down your bone. Um, we lay down most of our bone before the age of 30. Um, and then we're just trying to keep up with the race and maintain it. But smoking in early adulthood interferes with that. Um, and also they realize that it just um, tends to be people who smoke are less active, probably because it's harder to catch your breath um, because your lungs are already um, having a little bit of a disadvantage. So, um, but they also just show that people that have a uh, history of smoking, they have a higher incidence of hip fractures, they have a higher incidence of osteoporosis. Um, and so it's just not really a good thing to have in your background, but um, it was in the past. So what are we gonna do to fix it? And I'll hopefully show you some exercises that can help with that going forward in a little bit. I know all this sounds horrible. Um, so sun exposure, uh, it's great that we all wear sunscreen now. I, I wear it every day, which is wonderful, but they are thinking that maybe that's interfering a little bit with our vitamin D production. Um, and it, it, some of it also is just our geography. Luckily, Santa Rosa has some pretty good sunny days, usually unlike today. Um, but for the most part, um, it's the sunscreens that we're wearing for skin cancer that are interfering with our, our vitamin D production. The good news is you can take vitamin D and hopefully your physicians have you on or have looked at your vitamin D levels. Um, this is a blood test they can do to see if you're deficient, which is kind of cool because a lot of us were or are um, on our higher amounts of um, vitamin D than what this even recommends, including myself. So if you've not asked your physician for a vitamin D test, you could in your next physical um, just to see if you're deficient or not. Because like I said, sunscreen is great, but it interferes with our natural process. Um, and you need about 800 milligram or international units a, a day um, to get it. Most of the pills are about a thousand, um, but some doctors will put you on two or 3000 milligrams for a little while and then ramp it down just to catch you up after they do a blood test. So that's something if you haven't been aware of, it does help with the bone metabolism. 
uh, vitamin D and calcium help with getting that bone to actually become stronger and, and become um, more helpful. Also physical activity, inactivity. This is where I come into play. So I can change this part about you all. Um, lack of physical activity in youth is correlated with poor bone health. Again, if you don't use it, you lose it. So bones are gonna get stronger based on what's called Wolf's Law. So they're gonna respond to an outside force. So if you're a couch potato your entire life, your bones don't need to do anything more than be a couch potato. If you're a marathon runner, they're gonna have to be able to hold you up for a marathon. And so our bodies are wonderful in this respect for energy conservation. So if we don't need it, we don't keep putting into it. And that goes for bones, it goes for muscles, goes for memory, all of that. But bones is what we're talking about today. So that's what I'm gonna try and stick to. So if we have outside forces like compressive forces, they get stronger and denser. If we have an outside force that's like a pulling force, that's gonna get things longer. So that if you've ever seen a kid with Oshgood slaughter, that's because the muscles of the legs are getting a little too tight because they went through their growth spurt and then you get a big old bump on your knee. That's because of the pull. We don't see a whole lot of that, but the density aspect is what we wanna try and improve today. So that outside force becomes really important and that's something that we can utilize to our advantage to get them stronger. Um, and it'll also reduce that fracture incidence, which is really, really important. So how do we get them stronger? There's obviously the pharmacological option, which your physicians are all in control of, which is great. They know your medical background. Um, they're going to be able to look and see what you're going to interact with or what's not good for your kidneys or what's good for your heart and all that. So listen to them in regards to that. I don't really do a whole lot of that aspect because I'm not allowed to tell you to actually take any pills against my practice act, but I can tell you how to exercise and that's my specialty. So resistance exercise and impact exercise, those are the ones that we see having the most help on bones, bone health, because it's that outside force that's different from sitting around, it's different from walking around the house, it's different from just being an active adult. We want something more than that. Aerobic exercise is really important as well. Um, it helps keeping the, the bones healthy in the spine primarily and the hip. Those are the two areas that people get nervous about with osteoporosis. It's actually how I got to do this talk. We were talking about hips last time and osteoporosis came up in that talk. And then we thought, oh, I should do a talk on osteoporosis too out here because femoral uh, fractures are the most common or compression fractures of the spine are most common for people with osteoporosis and osteopenia. So resistance training alone isn't it. It does also have to have a little bit of an aerobic aspect to it. So that's that walking, jogging, kind of getting out and moving. Brisk walking is fine. You're gonna laugh because I actually mentioned skipping. Um, it was one of the options. I don't know how many of us still skip. Um, so these exercise guidelines right here for the osteopenia. So this is the people that are just shy of being osteoporosis. You just kind of first found out that your bones aren't as strong as they should be. We need um, at least two to three times a week of aerobic exercise because we need to have that little aerobic component to it. 15 to 60 minutes. Now it does not mean you have to go out and do 60 minutes the first time start with a five, 10 minute brisk walk around the block, work up to the 15 to 60 minutes is totally okay because we don't wanna overdo it either and make you so sore you can't move the next day. But this is additional to your regular activities around your day. So if you're osteoporosis and osteopenia, I mean, and you've been doing your normal little walk around the block for the last five years, this means you have to do something a little bit more intense than that. So walk a little bit faster or walk a little bit longer. It's not just maintaining at this point. You have to put a little extra oomph into it. That's the hard part is that extra part. The intensity needs to be about 70%. So you do need to be out of breath. You need to kind of not uh, really want to do it, um, but know that it is helpful for to see a change. And that's the difference between being physically active and exercise. Physically active is running around the house and doing all the chores and doing the errands and going on the dog walks. 
physical exercise, when we're actually exercising, that's with the intent to change something. That's with the intent to improve something. So it's a little different than just being active. And that is a mindset. So when you're trying to exercise, that extra little oomph, that extra little desire to go a little stronger, a little faster is actually good for your bones. Um, and then that impact um, needs to be moderate. So I joked a second ago about skipping, but that kind of intermittent jogging, the brisk walking, um, skipping, step aerobics, um, any of those that have a little bit of actual foot hit the ground kind of thing can be really good. Just walking through the house and being active isn't enough because you still got osteopenia with doing that. And that's the hard part to remember is that you've been doing that, your body's used to that, we have to go beyond that. And so that's when that little bit more brisk can help. So if you have an ailment or an injury, this might be where physical therapy comes in handy. So some people are told that they need to get out and do a little bit more impact, but they have a bad knee or they have a bad hip or they have a bad back. That might be where it's good to see a physical therapist to get an exercise program more personalized for your situation so that you can do the activity without making something that you have that you're trying to not get um, out of control or hurt, okay? But walking, unfortunately, isn't enough. It needs to be a little bit more. I wanna see everybody skipping after this out of here. We'll do it together. So osteoporosis is um, basically a little bit more um, ramped up from that. Um, basically, strength training is really, really important and you wanna target those muscle groups. So going back to that DEXA scan, when I talked about in the beginning, when they looked at the arm or the hip or the back, if your physical therapist or you know where your weakest point was, so say your arm was good and your femur was good, but your lumbar T-score didn't look great, you can try and do exercises around those muscles or your hip muscles. If the hip muscles aren't good uh, or the hip, the hip bone uh, density is not good, we can actually target those muscles um, to pull on the bone there. And some of the exercises I'm gonna show you today will do that. So weight bearing, obviously very important. So it's better to be actually upright and standing versus sitting um, if you can, just because that loads the spine for osteoporosis. Um, and this is kind of a cool little tidbit that basically if you're increasing some of your muscle strength and your balance, you're gonna have less likelihood of falling. So we talked earlier about if you fall and your bones are more brittle, you're more likely to break. That would be something that may be good to work on too is a little bit of balance because then we can reduce your fall risk by 35%, which is pretty important too. Um, so anybody over 80, 80 years old, the fall get the best fall risk reduction if they see a physical therapist or they start doing balance exercises. So if you're 80 and over, you guys are gonna get the best benefit. So that's kind of cool. Um, doesn't mean that if you're under 80, you don't get a benefit. It's just that they found that people over 80 have the best benefit to get stronger and less falling, um, better balance if they actually train it, which is kind of cool. Um, I mentioned earlier that slowly progressing is super important because if you go too fast, too hard, you're going to have injury and we don't want to have injuries because then you're less likely to keep up with the exercise. But if you're a little sore the day after, we call that delayed onset muscle soreness and it's totally appropriate. I always tell my patients, you know, a new exercise is kind of like going out in the garden after winter and you feel all those muscles at the back that you didn't remember you had all winter. It goes away in a couple of days. It's just a physiologic sign saying, hey, I did a little something more and I'm getting a little stronger from it. It's not a bad thing. And it goes away. And ice can be really helpful for that. So if some of these exercises, you start to feel your arm muscles that you haven't felt or your leg muscles that you haven't felt. It's okay. It just means that you're getting stronger. Kind of have a positive spin on it. It's not fun for a couple of days, but you are going to be stronger and it's going to help your bones. Um, so again, I'm going to reiterate walking. Just your normal walking isn't enough. We need to do something more. So we need to actually ump that up. So if you're walking the dog for your exercise, maybe add in a walk without the dog where you're walking brisk um, so that you get a little bit more oomph because dogs like to smell every single blade of grass and they're not always helpful for that impact, unfortunately. Um, references in case you wanted them. 
Um, also, before I get into the exercises, we do have um, on our website newsletters that go over things like osteoporosis or bursitis and shoulders and stuff. So there's also newsletters there. Same with Facebook, it gets linked to that too. So if you wanted more of these kind of generalized health and wellness things, we also have those on our site. But what I'm gonna get into now, if I can figure it out, is we're going to get into um, the exercises, which I will have to pull up the screen share again on the other page, which, let's see, I want my screen, yeah. Let's see, oh, that's my son. At least it's sharing. All right, here are some of the exercises we're gonna go over. Hopefully, yay, it pulled up, okay. So exercises. The first two that we have right here, I like these stretchy bands. I love these stretchy bands. They're nice because they're portable. Um, they're pretty affordable. You can get them in a pack of three or five over at Big Five or Dick's Sporting Goods or not. Um, if you are a patient at our clinic, we've probably given them to you because they're so convenient. So I mentioned T-scores for the hips. So if you're in that category, when you go home and you realize, hmm, that was my worst one, this is what you want to try and do for it. So I do recommend you actually sitting down to put your little guy on. So somebody's alerts going off and I don't know what that is. I don't know. But to get these little loopies on so nobody becomes a patient from falling, sit in a chair and slide it around your ankles, it's much safer. <laughs> and then stand up and you can have your chair as your helper, just in case, because you are kind of hobbled right now. So we have a few different directions we can go for the hip. So if your T-score in this area wasn't looking so hot, we're really far down on that negative number. You can do exercises forward, which is really nice because it's convenient. You can do this at home. You don't have to go to the gym for it. If you do go to the gym, you can do things like on the leg press. We can also go out to the side and out to the side. So all these pictures have these wonderful little options and we can also go backwards, okay? To do the one that's attached inward, you have to get a little bit more creative. We have to put that around something, which I'm gonna show you. Put your foot in and then you're gonna cross over and that's a little lower down. So I'll roll that down in just a second. So these exercises get all four components of the hip. They're basically helping to strengthen with resistance that muscle group around the hip to help with your T-score there. If you don't like the rubber bands because you're afraid of tripping, ankle weights can be really, really helpful too. Starting out with two, three pound ankle weights, put them around those little cuff weights. You can do the same thing. You don't have to worry about being hobbled, which is kind of nice. All of those exercises, and I'll scroll down to these ones right here so you can see that forward and back. They're strengthening this part right here of the hip bone. So this is that hip bone right here. We basically just had the hip go in all four different directions and you were pulling on it. That pulling, that resistance, that outside force, more than just walking, it's actually causing this to get a little stronger because it has that outside force. So this would be something that I would highly recommend if you have uh, that hip score that's a little low. Okay, yeah, that's a little hip. A lot of the muscles attach right there, actually. This part goes into the socket. I know it's super small, I'm sorry, but I can email these to anybody, it's just a PDF, okay? I think they're gonna try and get it set up to where you guys can it too. The other one that's really good is just actually sit downs and stand ups. Sounds kind of funny because we only do it once usually, but if you do these a bunch of times, you're gonna feel those muscles on the front of the legs. <laughs> and it usually takes about five or six to get into it, but it can be really, really good. And the nice thing is the chair behind you, if you do need to rest, it's right there. You don't have to worry about falling, okay? For somebody that's a little bit more advanced and they wanna use a step stool at home and they have their hand weights, they can do a step up. And if you have that up over when you push up, you're loading the spine a little bit more for the T-score there. So that's a really good one for that. It doesn't even have to be hand weights. You could hold water bottles 
16 ounces in each hand, that's just a little extra. And you're stepping up on that step and down. It is a higher functioning exercise on that step stool. So be careful, I don't want anybody falling. I'll help you if you do, but please don't. <laughs> um, but yeah, water bottles can be really, really effective. Every 16 ounces is about 400 grams. So um, it's about a pound, but um, so you can think about those little hamburger guys, those kind of the original water bottles. Um, most of the water bottles now are in the 20 ounces. So you're getting a little bit over a pound, which is great. Again, with water bottles, soup cans, whatever you got, or dumbbells, you can do the over. And starting out small with the little one pounders is fine. Uh, and working up to something heavier. If you have problems with your hands, say you have arthritis of the hands, get the cuff weights on the hands. You can do the same thing. You don't have to grip it. Really, really nice and easy. So you have the stretchy bands. And if you want to do this exercise, you can also step on the stretchy bands and come up. So they're very versatile. You can do it in any single way. It kind of just depends on what your body is going to let you do. Some people can't grip. Some people can't don't like the way that they feel like they're going to fall over with the stretchy bands. This is where if you have a meeting with one of the physical therapists, they can really cater it to you. These are just kind of generalized ideas. Um, that's kind of what we do. We work with your ailments if needed. Out to the side is another good one. Again, we're loading that humerus. So if your humeral score is not good, that's going to be good. But also I want to mention that if we're doing this stuff up and over and we're standing up, we're also loading our trunk. So we're loading that lumbar spine. So all of these arm ones that we're doing are doing two things. They're getting the arms and the trunk, which is good. So if your T-score in your trunk wasn't good, your lumbar spine, these all would be very, very good to add in. And bicep curls. I think we've all done bicep curls before. Not so much for the arms as it is the trunk. Again, you're loading, you're compressing those sp the, the spine. And then the row is another great one. If you have something to anchor it onto, this isn't going to go as great because the chair will move, but you can pull back. And again, it loads that spine again, giving a little bit of compression force is going to make things a little stronger. Okay. Let's see. I think those, oh, yep. A higher row. So pulling it up above the, um, the putting the band in the top of the door and pulling down again, compressing those spine, which is actually good in this case, because it's giving a little bit of that compressive forces to make the spine stronger. And then just putting the band lower and pulling up also works. So when you have the anchor at different levels, it changes the force on the spine. So you're getting a little bit different compressive forces. That's why it's good to do it above, middle and below. So you're getting all of those. If you only have time for one, it's fine, but it would be good to do all three angles so that you're getting that full compressive forces. Because this little guy right here is what you're working on. You're working on this area right here, okay? As we get older, this is what we're worried about crumbling in. And that's what we don't wanna have happen. If we're putting forces on it from above or below, generally above in this case, it's gonna give a little bit more load to the spine down here, okay? Because it has all of your body and that extra little two, three, four, five pounds. Okay. I think that was the last of the exercises. So this is where I wanna open the floor up to anybody that has any questions specifically about the exercises or anything in particular about osteoporosis that I could help with. Presentation, another outstanding presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Can you hear me with my mask on? Oh, good. A little closer. I have a question if you have the answer to this about calcium citrate versus calcium carbonate, because I was told to take calcium citrate. My issue is, is that I literally choke on these massively large pills. Can I take those and put them in a coffee grinder and grind them up to powder and put them in a drink and swallow them? 
Yeah. Perfect. And is calcium citrate better than carbonate? And it why? is. Why? So because it, the, your body absorbs calcium citrate better than calcium carbonate. And so Citrical is one of the big main name brand ones. I don't have any affiliations with them, but they're the one that comes to mind because that actually has a little bit of the, the acid in it, the, the vitamin C that actually helps absorb it. So that's calcium citrate. Calcium carbonate actually doesn't get absorbed as well in the body. And that's why it's just harder to absorb. If you do want to make your calcium more helpfully absorbed, it is good to have it with a glass of orange juice or a vitamin C pill if you're used to vitamin C pills. It just helps with that absorption. Um, quite often, if you look at the back of something like Centrical, they have the vitamin D, they have the vitamin C, and they have the, the, um, the calcium all in one. I like, I don't have any affiliations with this, but I do like the Viactive Chews because again, it has the vitamin D and all of that wrapped into one, which is nice. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Thank you. I could be incorrect about this, but I thought the Chews is carbonate. Um, I think they have both. Okay, and yeah. then my next question is, is it important to have magnesium with the calcium and the D to make it all work? The magnesium, there's not as much studies on it. The thing with taking too many minerals at once is you only have so much absorption. So you may wanna check with your physician and see if you should take them at separate times or together. I'm not sure on the magnesium, unfortunately. I just know that vitamin D, C, and calcium usually go together for absorption. And iron can be a little risky. A question here yeah. on the T score. Mm -hmm. Can you ever improve it or are you just preventing it from getting worse? Both. So I have seen patients over the years with exercise and pharmacological interventions see it get better. I've also seen patients not on medicine with just exercises get better. And I've seen people get worse with doing nothing or doing everything. So it is really all the options, which is why they continue to screen you. But yes, exercise has been shown and studied time and time again to be helpful for bones. Um, and you can improve your T-score. I had a little a gentleman recently with osteoporosis, and he actually changed it quite significantly in his hip, which was great. We were doing some exercises with him. Um, over the last six months, um, and he ended up having another score uh, looked at, and it was actually better. So it, it's not instantaneous, but it does get better over the course of six months to a year if you keep doing these types of exercises. Hold on. You know, because of the, um, uh, how the back, starts to, I forget what it's called, um, compress. Uh, is something like an inversion table, uh, it, it feels so good at the time, but is it good in the long term? So the compression table can be great just to unload the spine. So if you just want it for stretching in general, yes. Will it change your osteoporosis? No. Will it make it worse? Nope. But it can alleviate some of the compression forces that we all get. So as we get older, our discs naturally wear out, kind of like treads on a car tire. So they just kind of wear out. And the discs are these little spots in here between the bones. That's partly what accounts for some of our height loss. We usually lose about an inch or so. That's because these little discs right here get a little bit more um, worn out. And then what he's asking about is the traction. If we go like this and we use gravity, it just gives a little gentle stretch and unloads that. The reason why it feels good is because, yeah, it's taking off the effects of gravity, which is pretty standard, um, that 9.8 meters per second squared. And it opens up the space where those nerves come out. The lumbar spine in particular, those are the ones where when they're not happy is the sciatica that comes to talk to you and you feel that lovely back down the leg pain. If it's a little higher up, you might feel it kind of into the groin and upper leg if it's that little upper lumbar spine. But usually that leg pain that's associated with the back problem because one of these little nerves guys is pinched. So yeah, the inversion table could be absolutely fine. You're just stretching out those ligaments. You're not gonna do anything to the bones. 
Um, if you've never done the inversion table before, you may give yourself a little bit of vertigo. So don't go all the way upside down. I believe John over at the um, fitness center is really good about showing people how far to start out. Just a little bit's good. And then as you tolerate that, you can always get a little bit more to get that, that opened up. But it can be great to help out um, just because, yeah, compressive forces don't feel good as we get older, but it happens to us all, including myself. 38 and I have arthritis in my back. So I, I get it. It's only going to get better. <laughs> I know. Any other questions? And then at the end, if any of you guys have any actual questions that you're not comfortable talking about in the whole group setting, don't hesitate to come up and ask. I can also give you the exercises. And as I said before, these are generalized exercises on this handout. Say you have arthritis of the CMC joint, that hand joint, and you're just not up to being able to do something with weights. There are ways to work around it. And a physical therapist who's the movement expert can do that. We have our clinic right over here. And usually it just takes a, a, point, a trip to the doctor's office, to your primary care in particular, to say, hey, I'd like to get some specialized exercises. I know exercise is good for me, but I don't want to mess up my knee or I have a shoulder replacement. I don't want to mess it up. Can I just make sure that I'm guided properly? And a physical therapist can do that. So you can have this covered or need insurance if you um, basically have that physician saying, yep, they need a little bit more one-on-one -on -one care. So when these exercises, if you're just trying them out and they're not 100% comfortable for you, it's okay. It doesn't mean that you have to give up on exercise. I still want you to exercise. We just need to find the right ones that are working for your body. And every single body's body's birth is different. So uh, we understand that and the changes that need to be made. Okay. Serena, you're such a clear speaker. We <laughs> are. We have oh, we one do more. have questions. Yeah. Um, I, I just hope you come back again I, with another topic. Any topic you guys want, physical therapy wise. Or a six-year-old. Do you know of any exercise classes in the Santa Rosa area that would be addressing this specific problem? You know, I don't. That would be a great thing to look into. Um, hmm. Most of the classes are just, you know, like Zumba or something like that. Um, actually, you could make Zumba. If you, so if you like dancing or ballroom dance or something like that, that's, that would be an impact force, which you could do. Um, swing dancing, Zumba, any of those step class type of stuff, but actual class just for osteoporosis, I don't think there is one. Um, well, this is a great opportunity to say, we to, should make one for me to tell you all about the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m. classes right here in Berger. They're with the Oakmont Health Initiative and Joreen and Nicole run these wonderful classes that are suitable for us seniors. And you don't have to get down on the floor for the second part. You can just do the first part, but it's a great workout. I get my heart rate up every time. And in an analogous uh, way, the there's a big balance class group here. Oh yeah. And so you, you want to be aware of that if that's a part of if that can get you 35 percent less likely to fall, that's a good thing. Uh -huh. So that's always a no one. Yeah. Same with physical therapy. So if say you have noticed over the last year as we've come out of the pandemic that you're still not really comfortable going out because it's not now that pandemic as much, but it's because you're afraid of falling. You can always let your physician know that as well. So in the event of you're afraid of falling, but you haven't fallen yet, they would rather have you get treated for a little bit of a balance loss now than a fall on a broken leg or a broken arm later. Um, again, just giving you some strategies and tips, screening your balance, making sure that you don't actually have to have a fall if you wanted to get it worked on to work on your balance. And you can improve balance with exercises as well. So that's something also to be aware of. And I believe that balance class is on Friday mornings at 9.30, if I'm not mistaken, in the East Rec. And it's run by Mary Hastings. Who, it's a junior college class, so it's free for us seniors. All JC older adult classes are free. Uh, and Mary also teaches water aerobics, which is another great resistance training 
uh, for our exercise program. Yeah, absolutely. That's great that they're doing those classes again. I didn't know that they picked those back up. So utilize those classes. Water can be wonderful resistance. The faster you move in the water, the better the resistance gets. You get more turbulence. So you can, if you want to walk but you have a back problem, walk fast in the water. If you want to move the arms fast, you can do bicep curls. You can do opens and closes. You can do all sorts of things in the water. So if there's any water exercises anybody wants as well, that's, that's their jam. They like the water aerobics. I can also point you in a few directions for that as well. Oh. <clears throat> okay. Uh, uh, what's the difference between osteoporosis and arthritis? Okay, that's a great question. And we get that a lot on the, whole, the um, health histories. So osteoporosis is the entire bone is getting more porous, like that pumice stone osteoarthritis is the cartilage. So between your shoulder joints, between your hips, between your knees, that wears out over time as well. Those are your little shock absorbers. You also can get it in your hands. You can pretty much get it anywhere. I have it myself in my foot. I've had it since I was 22 there and lovely 38th birthday gift in my back. I was a retired, I'm a retired gymnast, so it's bound to happen. But it's just that I played really hard as a gymnast and I wore those parts out a little faster. Eventually need to have something done about it. But in the meantime, studies show time and time again, finding an activity that you can do to stay active and moving is most important. So again, if you like swimming, you like walking, you like Pilates, you like the gym, you like riding the new step or the bike to keep you moving, that's ideal because it keeps that synovial fluid moving. We cannot take anything or eat anything to make those that that cartilage come back there are some uh, injectables that they have some gels some thin sin and stuff for that um, which can help delay the process but eventually that's what leads to that total joint replacement whether it's the hip the knee or the shoulder those are the main ones a few times we get to see a few ankles or they'll start fusing things in the, the hand but yeah so that's the main difference one's cartilage and the other ones, the bones getting more porous. And they look really similar when you look at them next to each other on the health history form. Unfortunately, eating jello doesn't help. But if you're curious, here's a list of some foods so you can think if any of these sound good. Kale, bok choy, yogurt, cottage cheese, broccoli, spinach, any kind of canned seafood, cheese, chia seeds and sesame seeds, almonds, tofu, black beans, dried figs, whey protein powder, soy milk, orange juice, and any cereal, both of those last two being fortified is how you're getting it. That's usually that calcium carboxinate though, and not the citrus. So those are um, some foods that um, if you like, they're not bad for you. They're good for your calcium. Um, and it kind of gets a little bit of everything in there. Um, a lot of people are always surprised that the dark leafy greens, the spinach and the kale are so good for you on so many levels. So um, when your mom told you to eat your vegetables, she was right. Because usually the canned seed food is smaller. That was the question, why canned? Because the canned seed food is smaller, like sardines and anchovies, and they're anticipating you eating the bones. So you're getting that. You're actually eating the bones. Yeah. You know, you might just have given us the topic for next year's presentation by Serena. <laughs> Osteoarthritis would be a good one, yes? Sure. <laughs> well, yes, one more. That's okay. That's why we're here. Thank you. The last person just brought something else to mind. What is the big deal about collagen? Hype or good? It's kind of mixed. It's the new hype. Um, there are some studies on it. So the book is still out, kind of like turmeric for inflammation. Is it really helpful? Is it not? Um, they're still looking into it. Is it going to harm you? Is it going to interfere with anything at this point? They don't think so. So give it a try. I did glucosamine for years when I was um, after my um, gymnastics injuries, just in case, because I figured, well, it, it's better than nothing. And then when I was done with the sport, I decided, okay, I, I'm not playing as hard. I can get rid of it, but it's not going to hurt me. Um, but, you know, it's expensive. So it means you want to spend $50 a month on 
something that doesn't work. I mean, you could try it for one month, see if it makes a difference, go off. Um, but the studies are not just not there yet because it is kind of new. Yeah. Thank you, Serena, for an excellent presentation. Please remember your cell phones. Turn them back on.